Hello, this is part 4 of my video tutorial series about switched mode power supplies. After talking about non-switching AC to AC, AC to DC and DC to DC conversion techniques in parts 1 and 2, I dealt with the principal operation of the first two switching topologies, namely the charge pump and the buck converter in part 3. If you haven't watched those three videos yet, I recommend you to do so. While explaining the working principle of the buck converter, we dealt with the first switching topology that employs an inductor is an integral part of its operation mechanism. Without understanding the basics of magnetism and the behavior of switched inductors, it is not possible to grasp the idea behind all the switching topologies that will follow in this tutorial series. Therefore, I will spend a lot of time talking about these basic ideas in the following videos. But first let us talk about the boost converter, which will provide us with an excellent starting point to ask some general questions about magnetic components. As I explained in part 3, the charge pump, which relies on switched capacitors alone, is capable of delivering output voltages which are higher than its input voltage, but is however not suited to convert electrical power levels of more than a few watts. The buck converter, on the other hand, can be employed for even very high power applications, but its output voltage is restricted to values smaller than the input voltage. So, the open question would now be, is there a switching converter that can step up a DC input voltage and yet provide a much bigger output power than the charge pump? Well, the answer is yes, it's the boost converter. And its principle of operation is actually well known for a long time and it is most probably around you all your life without you ever noticing it. What am I talking about? Well, if you look under the hood of older cars like this 1970s Mercedes, you will somewhere find a component like this. It's the so-called ignition coil which is used to generate a high voltage DC pulse which causes a small electric arc called a spark between the two electrodes of the spark plug. It is used to trigger the controlled explosion of the air-fuel mixture inside the combustion chamber. The same kind of coil can also be found inside this high voltage power supply for helium neon lasers. According to a sign on the back, the output voltage is more than 1.4 kilovolts. But how do you produce a voltage much higher than the input voltage with the help of an inductor? Well, this is how it works. All you basically need is a voltage source, a switch and a coil. Before any switching action starts, the current through the coil as well as the voltage across it is of course zero. Once you close the switch, the on period starts. The voltage VL across the inductor becomes V in instantaneously. Because of the potential difference between the two ends of the coil, a current wants to flow through it. But inductors always resist the change of current through them. For T equals zero, being directly in the moment where the switch is closed, the current is still zero and only after a while starts to rise. As the current rises, a likewise rising magnetic field is created by the inductor in which magnetic energy is stored. After a certain time, the current through the inductor comes very near to the maximum current, only limited by the internal resistance of the source. The system is now in what is called steady state. And the magnetic flux caused by the inductor, like the current through it, are nearly constant. As the current decreased and became maximum, the voltage across the inductor has become zero. What just happened here is called a transient. And I guess I will make a special video about calculating transients as an addition to the series. But what is really interesting here is what happens now. When you open the switch again and go into the off period, the current path leading to the inductor is instantaneously cut off. But again, the inductor tries to resist the change of current through it, which was forced by opening the switch. The magnetic field caused by the rising of the current during the on period 
is now rapidly collapsing, inducing a very high voltage across the inductor. This voltage is reversed in polarity to the voltage across the coil during T on. This so-called flyback voltage can be so high that it can even create an electric arc across the switch. To utilize this electric arc, a small spark gap in the form of a spark plug is provided. The high electric field strength between the two spark plug electrodes allows the creation of an arc. The arc is a conductive plasma of ionized gas which virtually shorts out the inductor. In this way, the inductor has for a short time created a new current path over which the magnetic energy stored in the now rapidly collapsing magnetic field is discharged. Now in the ignition system of cars, this effect is used to keep the combustion engine running. But it also can be slightly modified with some additional circuitry to comprise a useful DC to DC switching converter for constant output voltages rather than one short DC pulse. And this is how it's done. First, the spark gap is removed. Then a second switch and an output capacitor is added, completing the principal boost converter topology. Now let us go through its operation. Before the beginning of any switching, the current through the inductor is zero. The voltage across the inductor, as well as the output voltage, are also zero. Now T on begins. The switch S1 is closed, creating a loop over the inductor L. A magnetic field is created by the inductor in which magnetic energy is stored. Now S1 is opened, rapidly followed by S2 closing. The old current path of S1 is cut off and no other direct current path is provided. Again, a flyback voltage is induced across the inductor. But instead of causing an electric arc like in the car ignition system, the energy of the magnetic field is now discharged via the switch S2 into the output capacitor CO. At the end of that discharging process, the output voltage is the sum of the input voltage plus the flyback voltage that was induced across the coil during the off period. When a load is now attached to the output capacitor, this process has to be repeated in rapid succession. To allow many thousands of switching operations per second, the switch 1 is replaced by a power transistor. Nowadays, usually a power MOSFET like you see here. The second switch can also be a transistor, but in most cases it is realized by a fast switching diode of some kind. Like with a buck converter, the boost converter can be controlled by pulse width modulation with the help of some kind of square wave generator. And its output voltage can also be adjusted to a certain value by changing the duty cycle. The equation for the duty cycle of the boost converter is VO equals VI divided by 1 minus D. So to sum it up, you can say that the boost converter is an inductor which is first switched in parallel to a voltage source which is then abruptly disconnected, forcing the build-up of a flyback voltage across the inductor. That is then added to the input voltage to obtain an output voltage always bigger than the input voltage. To demonstrate this to you, let me show you some examples of actual real-world boost converter action. Here you see a 12 volt battery and a light bulb that is actually rated for 230 volts. Witness how you can see no light at all coming from the bulb as I attach it to the battery. Now I connect this simple boost converter circuit between the battery and the bulb. By turning the trim port on the board I can adjust the duty cycle of the boost converter and step up the output voltage. As you can see on the DMM, the voltage at the output of the converter is now many times bigger than the actual source voltage. And here you can see me doing the exact same thing with this self-made RC car motor drive. First without and then with the boost converter in action.
Advantages and disadvantages of the boost converter. The biggest advantage of the boost converter is its capability to produce an output voltage bigger than the input voltage at mid-range power levels without the need of a transformer. The boost converter is thus simpler in construction than other topologies which can also step up voltages. But because of that lack of a transformer, the boost converter does not provide electrical isolation and is therefore not suited for mains powered applications. It should only be used in battery powered circuits or on the secondary side of a transformer. A typical application for the boost converter are for example these car laptop chargers which step up the car battery's 12 volts to a value around 20 volts that is needed to power laptops. If you want to play around with a boost converter without building one from scratch, you can buy such a charger. In many cases you can even change the output voltage by simply replacing one or two resistors. But as I said a couple of times before, how to build a real boost converter will be dealt with in a special in detail design video once all the basics have been explained. Well, now that you have seen how the boost converter operates, you might and should still have some open questions about the behavior of the inductor. For example, you might wonder about the following points. What does it mean that inductors resist the change of current flowing through them? Why is the voltage VL reversing during the off period? Why can VL become bigger than VI during the off period? Why does the direction of the current IL not reverse though VL reverses? What is magnetic flux? What is a transient? And so on and so forth. Knowing and understanding the proper answer to these questions is absolutely key to grasp the ideas behind switched mode power supplies. Therefore, I will try to answer these questions in the following video, leading us to the understanding of the following topologies, like the buck boost converter and the flyback converter. So, if you like this video, please watch my other videos and subscribe to my channel.